think we have down here, where we are here now, we are only 700 feet above the level of the sea, so that is up there, it's 2133. Have you been up and up the mountain yourself? Thousands of times. Mm -hmm. Thousands of times. Well, how did you like it up there? Well, I liked it all right. It was all right for in my time for sheep. Mm -hmm. Any good stories about the mountain at all? No. None at all? No, hardly anything at all. It was too black. How about not, all the not, other... not fit for an outlaw or anyone of that description. It wouldn't be safe up there. Yes, it was too, it was too, too open. Mm -hmm. uh, could hardly get away of it. How about the putching? Any putching there? No. Uh, it was really clean for very recent years. There's some story about German Bengali on the mountain, isn't there? Well, they lived um, about a mile down late in the eastern side, towards the Mukroom direction. And they were supposed to have sheltered? Yes, they were supposed to. Uh, the place was up to the present day. It was called uh, the Bed of Dermid and Grany. From Malahaganish, we head north now to Limerick and beyond, into County Clare. There, in another bleak spot on the mountain top, is the site of the Mahara transmitter. Once again, it was a matter of starting from the very beginning and building a road. This road up to Mahara had to be built through a state forest. The trees cut down were used in laying the foundations of the road itself. The cattle are now used to traffic on a road where there was never a road before, and they are supremely uninterested. Trees get blown down and block the road, but that's only a minor problem. The road winds on through the forest to the top of the hill and into the site, 1,300 feet above sea level. Mahara has its own special problem, mud and water and soft ground. The builder's foreman at Mahara, William Murphy, told me what the problems were. How the base is constructed? Well, you excavate, they excavate, dig the holes down in the bog, down through the piece, approximately nine feet deep, they are, until you get to the solid rock. And then you go through the rock three to four feet deep. Well, then when you get on that, oh, the, the base of the excavation has to be drilled and reinforcing put in. And then we concrete that on top of that then. We pour the concrete on top of that. Now, the ground is very soft out to the bases. How do you manage mm. to get the concrete out to them? Well, we, we have constructed a roadway out of lots of trees and cut down branches of trees. And we lay those out first on the bog. Well, then we put a lot of filling stones and that on top of it and we were managed to be able to drive out the tractor and the dumper and transport the concrete back and forth from those holes. Now, do you think you've solved the problem? Oh, definitely. I think it was, did uh, create a problem in the beginning. There were lots of suggestions, but I think we have mastered it now. These roads have been 100% success. The only problem now is the water with the other two we have to do. There's excessive water. It would mean the pumping out of those holes. And and also the caving in of the sides of the excavation, which has been a constant source of worry since we started. How are you going to solve this? Well, we, we'll let it slip in, I think, isn't it? And when it has slipped in, we just tr throw it out again, and then we probably shore up the sides of the excavation to prevent it from falling in. How much concrete goes into these bases? Well, in the outer base is approximately 100 cubic yards of concrete. And what? 20 lorry loads, say, roughly, concrete. How about drainage? Have you tried any... Well, we have tried drainage, but when you get down to the water level of the bog, the, they just sort of cave in to the sides of them. So it's not worth the effort. And I think just continually pumping out the water is the only answer to it. Digging a hole on the top of Mahara ought to be a simple affair, but it's not. There is a rock foundation with 10 feet of bog over it. To get to the rock is simple enough, but as soon as the hole is cleared through the rock, it starts to fill in again, as rain makes the sides of the hole move together. The first site position slid away altogether. From October last year until March, the only shelter was an old bus. 
Every morning almost, it would be flooded from the previous night's rain. And when it snowed, the state of the bog when the snow melted is better imagined than described. The holes had to be dug into the rock to give a solid foundation for the eight anchor bases for the mast. These are the points at which the wire hawsers bracing the mast are attached. Each base, as William Murphy said, contains a hundred cubic yards of concrete, about a hundred tons to each one, and twenty or so lorry loads of concrete go to each base. The bases are reinforced with wire mesh and steel bars. They have to be strong, for the pull on each cable on these bases when they are completed is equal to that exerted by 20 lorries, all pulling at full power. The strain on each of the light cables must be perfectly equal. If it were not, the first high wind that blew up would twist the mast and eventually blow it down. Building these heavy concrete bases involves much moving about the site by lorries. Here again, the soft surface of the bog covering the whole site slows things down considerably. To enable the lorries to move at all, pads had to be laid from the central point where the concrete was mixed to each of the bases. Brush, rubble and wood was used, and the roof for the building housing the equipment had to be of reinforced concrete. The mast in winter carries a lot of extra weight in the form of ice. When the ice is blown down or falls, it could hit the roof of the building with the effect of a small bomb. The completed base looks like this. What's it like to work here? Pather Dempsey, one of the electronic engineers at the station, talked to me about it. Father. As a Dublin man who has worked in two cities, Dublin and London, what's it like to work on the top of a mountain in a remote part in the west of Ireland? Well, for me, it's been quite a change. I've got too tired of city life in a way and, and nine to five jobs. And I feel that jobs like this where one is not too sure of their hours, not too sure of conditions, there's an element of danger and excitement. It is a pleasant change. It's pleasant to get away from the hustle and bustle of city life. I've noticed myself when I travel back to Dublin now, I'm just mad keen to get back to the, sort of the happy-go atmosphere of the west part of Ireland. There is the element of danger in working up there, isn't there? Well, the only the element of danger consists in weather conditions, severe weather conditions in winter times. We haven't experienced any as yet, except for a few nights of bad fog. We've almost gone off the roads travelling down. But um, we expect to have small little obstacles in um, travelling and that, but we'll overcome them. And uh, I think we'll enjoy our stay here no matter how long or how short it may be. The equipment is largely installed in Mohara. The installation is being done by Telefisher and engineers. In other transmitter stations, this was done by the manufacturers. The supervising engineer in charge of installation is Mr. Dick Halls of Essex. Now behind us, Mr. Halls, I see uh, all the crates in which the equipment arrived. Who actually does the installing here? Um, it's been done by Air and staff themselves under my supervision. And they're all completely new to this? Um, with the exception of the um, engineers in charge, um, the personnel are, are all new, yes. Is it hard to teach people this in 